Chomsky is a world-renowned political activist, writer, and professor of linguistics at MIT. The New York Times book review said of him, judged in terms of the power, range, novelty, and influence of his thought, Noam Chomsky is arguably the most important intellectual alive. To which he adds, Yeah, nobody ever quotes the next sentence. How can he write such terrible things about the U.S. foreign policy or something like that? Yeah. That, uh, that uh, addition kind of made your day, didn't it? Oh, yeah. That made me feel I wasn't doing something wrong. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your background. You grew up in Philadelphia. Your parents were Hebrew teachers, I believe. Mm -hmm. It was uh, basically first-generation uh, immigrant family. Uh, they were very much immersed in the local Jewish community, Hebrew education. Uh, this is the 1930s, so it's uh, early Zionism, pre-state Zionism. Uh, that was the milieu. My own life was, you know, soon became my own life. But uh, uh, that was the background that I came out of. And uh, you went to camp, as I recall? Uh, you later on, when I was a young teenager, 11, 12, uh, we, were, we went to uh, Hebrew-speaking camps. And then I, first as a camper, then later as a counselor, uh, helped. You were proficient in Hebrew very early? Um, reasonably. We, uh, uh, no, proficient. Uh, it's a matter of measuring. But yes, I could get by. And I read, re read very easily. Uh, I had read a lot of, uh, I grew up immersed in Hebrew literature and Bible and so on. In Hebrew, that is. Yeah. You uh, got part of, I guess, your political education uh, on a street corner in New York. In a sense, yeah. I had an uncle who, uh, this is again the 1930s and early 40s, uh, so a lot, the whole family was mostly unemployed, unemployed seamstresses, uh, working people, and so on. But there were few who had jobs, and one uncle uh, had a severe disability, and he was able to get a, a newsstand under a, one of the New Deal-type programs that were around in those days. So the newsstand was the place which supported half the family. Uh, but uh, he was also a very, he himself had never gone through school, but uh, he was very uh, well educated, more so than almost anybody I've met. And the newsstand became a center for uh, a lot of emigre intellectuals from Europe who would hang around there in the evenings and have fascinating discussions. And uh, it was a lot of fun to just uh, be serving newspapers and listening. So you would, um, what, jump on the train from Philadelphia? As soon as I was old enough to take the train by myself, at, uh, 12 or so, I'd uh, head off to New York as soon as I had a chance, stay with my relatives, uh, who were a very lively bunch of Jewish working class, left uh, uh, all involved in intellectual culture, so a you know, mixture of strange Marxist groups and the Budapest String Quartet and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, although very few of them had had anything in the way of formal education, except very elementary, but didn't matter. And uh, then I'd spend my time uh, wandering up and down uh, something that's long since disappeared. But uh, Fourth Avenue below Union Square used to be full of little secondhand bookstores. Uh, again, a lot of European exiles would have their own particular uh, slant, you know, Spanish anarchism or some other thing. And, uh, that was fa fascinating, too. They're very eager to talk to some young person coming in. It wasn't that usual, so got special treatment. And uh, picked up a lot, a lot of literature, too. In fact, when I started writing about these things years later, I uh, used a lot of primary documentation that I picked up uh, around that time, which wasn't available elsewhere. What kind of stuff do they talk about the newsstand? Um, there was a lot of... Uh, uh, and many of the uh, emigres were, happened to be uh, psychiatrists, like German Jewish uh, psychiatrists. So there's a lot of uh, Freud, uh, Steckel, um, that sort of thing. And then every variety of uh, left-wing politics you can think of. These were very lively days. I mean, political discussion was common and uh, just part of everybody's life. 
And how did you discover linguistics as your field? Through politics, actually. I, uh, this is back in Philadelphia. I met uh, Zelig Harris. Uh, I was about, I guess, 16 or 17 and pretty bored with college. I was thinking of dropping out. Uh, but I happened to meet him through political contacts. Uh, he himself was uh, was a very uh, influential uh, figure among uh, young intellectuals, mostly Jewish, but not completely. Uh, much more so than is known, because he didn't write much. But uh, many people passed through his influence, who many of them well known. And I was one of the younger ones. And uh, he was uh, his interests were a sort of a, a, a independent left, sort of anti-Bolshevik left, and uh, what was then called Zionism, now it would be called anti-Zionism, uh, commitment to uh, a future um, binational Jewish Arab uh, uh, working class based community in what was then Palestine, which was part of the Zionist movement at the time. Now it would be considered different, and I was already interested in that, so meeting him was a exciting and became an influence. I later discovered he was a professor of linguistics at, uh, at Penn, and in fact, you know, one of the leading figures in the world, and got drawn into his courses, and back into college, in fact. You have uh, come to change your views about uh, Israel, uh, Israeli politics, over the years. Not that much. I still believe pretty much what I you know, of course, it's different now than when I was 12 years old, but I, basically the same point of view. I mean, the c circumstances have changed, but uh, my own position hasn't changed very much. What is your position, and how have the circumstances changed? Well, remember, that was pre-state. Right. Uh, so, of course, everything changed when the state was established. Uh, although, uh, I maintained my involvement and interest. In fact, I came pretty close to living there, my wife and I spent some time on a kibbutz, we might have gone back, it was a question. Uh, but uh, I, I, I was opposed to the establishment of a Jewish state, which again was part of the Zionist movement at the time. You know, not a huge part, but there was an element of it that thought a Jewish state is a bad stake. I thought so then, I still think so. A Jewish uh, state as opposed to a... A democratic state. It, the two are inconsistent. I mean, people can try whatever manipulation they like, but uh, if the United States were a Christian state in anything but symbolism, it wouldn't be a democratic state. I mean, you know, taking Sunday off is okay, but uh, if there's real discriminatory uh, legislation and practice that distinguished Christians from non-Christians or whites from non-whites, uh, to that extent it would be a flawed democracy, almost by definition. And that's intrinsic in, uh, uh, in the form of the Jewish state that was established. I mean, the high court in Israel uh, actually declared it to be the state of the Jewish people in Israel and the diaspora. So my state, but not the state of a Palestinian Arab citizen of Israel. Uh, and this shows itself in all kinds of ways. Uh, but it became much more, all of these problems became far more exacerbated uh, after 1967, when the military occupation began, it's now in its 36th year, and uh, then all sorts of things happened. I mean, in, in 1971, uh, Israel really had to make a what turned out to be a fateful decision. Uh, they received uh, an offer from uh, Egypt through the UN mediator Gunnar Yari uh, to uh, have a f uh, Egypt offered a full peace treaty if Israel would withdraw just from Egyptian territory, not, nothing about the Palestinians, no West Bank. Uh, it was discussed internally in Israel in the, uh, now we know it from released cabinet records, but then in the Hebrew press. They knew that it was a possibility of peace and integration into the region. The choice was that or expansion, uh, which means permanent confrontation, uh, dependence, crucial dependence on the United States, and they chose the latter course. Uh, and a lot of things have followed from that, which are, in my view, very harmful to the society and extremely dangerous, and leading to a constant threat of uh, 
a very serious war, plus uh, 35 years of persecution of an, of an oppressed population. That has changed things enormously. Do, do you see any end to that? Yeah, a very simple end. In fact, everyone in the world knows what it is and has known for years. The end is uh, a diplomatic set. I mean, it gets m more remote the longer you delay it. But the end has been, for since the 1970s, a uh, political settlement on the internationally recognized border, the pre, pre-war border, uh, pre-June 67, uh, with uh, mutual and minor territorial adjustments and uh, other arrangements about other matters. The crucial matter is territorial. Uh, that's uh, been the international consensus since uh, the mid-1970s. Uh, the U.S. has unilaterally blocked it and still does. Uh, and as long as that continues, there won't be a political settlement. What about Jerusalem? Jerusalem, you can finesse one way or another. I mean, theoretically, it's supposed to, uh, under the original U.N. resolutions, it's supposed to be an internationalized city. Okay, that's not going to happen. Uh, but uh, Jewish and Arab neighborhoods could be mostly Jewish, mostly Arab neighborhoods could be separated. Two capitals could be set up side by side. Uh, but the uh, Palestinian one would have to have access to the Palestinian state. Now, that's the crucial issue. Uh, and many people have pointed out, I think correctly, that uh, a Jerusalem is a problem you could probably settle in 15 minutes. Uh, the main problems are the territorial boundaries. As we speak, uh, the White House has announced that it will uh, declare an end to the war in Iraq tomorrow. In your opinion, what was that war all about? Well, uh, we can be certain about one thing. Uh, the White House made it very clear that nothing it said could be taken seriously. So we know that the reasons they gave can't be the reasons. The, the way we know that is because they are contradicted every day. I mean, one day, uh, the single question, as they put it, is Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. If they get rid of the weapons of mass destruction, it's all over. The next day, it turned out they didn't make any difference what they did about their weapons. Uh, we were going to, we, we had to impose our own regime, what's called Re regime, regime change. change yeah. And the third day, it was some other story. So we can put aside the official explanations. They uh, made it clear to us that they're not to be taken seriously. So then we have to speculate, what was it about? And I think it's some pretty clear, plausible explanations. I mean, first of all, there's a background issue, which doesn't account for the timing of the war, but is always in the background. And that is that uh, Iraq has the second largest oil reserves in the world. It's always been clear that one way or another, the US would regain control over them or seek to do so. It does dominate, the U.S. does dominate the uh, Gulf energy producing region, which is by far the largest and richest in the world and will be for another couple of generations. Now, that's been policy since the Second World War. Uh, the Iraq was kind of an anomaly in that it broke out of it and it, there would be an effort to get it back in, that was certain. Uh, what about the timing? Well. Uh, the timing is kind of striking. Uh, if you look at the propaganda about invasion of Iraq, uh, it really begins last September. I mean, it was sort of simmering in the background. But in September, that's uh, when Condoleezza Rice uh, uh, told us about uh, you know, the mushroom cloud and uh, uh, the massive uh, government propaganda disseminated uncritically by the media uh, was produced about Iraq being uh, threat to our survival and uh, intimations that Iraq was behind the September 11th uh, 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 attacks and was planning new ones. And that showed up very quickly in the polls. Uh, by the end of September, a majority of the population uh, actually believed that Iraq was a serious threat to U.S. security. And uh, over the months, uh, the number of people who believed that Iraq was involved in the September 11th attacks has reached something like 50 percent, probably. Uh, there's, uh, there's nobody in the world who believes anything like this, including the CIA. But it did come to be public opinion. And those opinions are very strongly correlated with support for the war, not surprisingly. Well, why September? Well, a couple other things happened in September. 
uh, one thing that happened was it, it was the opening of the uh, midterm election campaign. And as Karl Rove, campaign manager, had already uh, informed Republican uh, activists, uh, they cannot go into the campaign with social and uh, economic issues being prominent or they'll get smashed. There have to be security issues which will lead people to, they hope correctly, to suppress their concerns about uh, jobs, pensions, uh, Enron, and so on, in favor of uh, safety, which will flock to power. Uh, and it worked, barely. Uh, the uh, uh, Rove has already said they're going to have to do the next, the same for the presidential campaign. And in fact, that ran right through the 80s when the same people were running Washington pushing the panic button every year over something or other. Uh, the other thing that happened, which I think is even more significant, is uh, that they announced the uh, a national security strategy in September, uh, which calls for, uh, it sent plenty of shutters around the world, including the US foreign policy elite. Uh, this was a substantial change in official policy. Um, there are precedents, but it's never been official policy before. There was a policy of openly announced uh, intention to rule the world by force and to uh, prevent any potential challenge to that domination. It's called preemptive war, but it's not preemptive, it's preventive, and even that's an exaggeration. We'll just attack anyone who's in the way. Well, when you announce a doctrine, you have to illustrate it. Uh, otherwise, nobody takes it seriously. Uh, to illustrate the doctrine of preventive war, uh, you have to pick uh, the appropriate target. First of all, it has to be weak and defenseless. There's no point attacking anybody who can fight back. That's ridiculous. So it has to be weak and defenseless. Uh, on the other hand, it can't be, say, uh, you know, Burundi, because that's worthless. Nobody, who wants it? It has to be weak, defenseless, and important. Okay, that spells Iraq. Uh, and that was a perfect uh, Petri dish, as the New York Times called it, test case for, to illustrate the new norm of preventive war to get the world to understand we mean it. Uh, and I think those factors probably account for the timing. Uh, in the background is the long-term interest. But as I say, you can't, uh, 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 these have to be speculations because there's no official information that means anything. It's all self-contradictory. What do you expect uh, will follow in Iraq? Uh, do you expect democracy to uh, blossom there? A special kind of democracy. Uh, we have a hundred years of experience in our backyard to go by. The U.S. has dominated uh, Central America and the Caribbean for a century. It's had plenty of influence in other places. And it has tolerated, even fostered, democracy but on a condition. The democratic decision has to conform to US policy. Uh, if a country's democratic choices uh, go in opposition to US policy, the government's overthrown, uh, either by uh, coup or invasion or economic strangulation or something or other. And in fact, this is extremely explicit in policy formation. It takes discipline not to see it. Uh, so, for example, in the case of Cuba, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, international terrorist attack on Cuba, and that's what it is, uh, began within months after Castro's takeover. It was very sharply escalated by the Kennedy administration. Uh, we now have the internal documents that discuss, describe what they had in mind, and it's the same as everywhere else, uh, uh, Guatemala, Iran, everywhere. The, what they state is that uh, uh, the very existence of the Castro regime is successful defiance of U.S. policies going back 150 years. Uh, policies are that the region has to be subordinated to U.S. power. And this is successful defiance of that. doesn't matter what they do, they've got to conform. Uh, the wars in Central America in the 1980s were to impose a form of democracy uh, which uh, uh, would be, quote, a leading specialist, top-down forms of democracy uh, in which uh, uh, traditional elites main, who, who have been associated with the United States retain power. Gee, I'm quoting uh, 
Thomas Carruthers, who's uh, a leading historian, but also writes from the inside. He was part of Reagan's uh, so-called democracy enhancement programs in the State Department. And that's a correct characterization, and that's what will happen in Iraq. I mean, if, uh, the, if the majority of the population happens to be Shiite, I uh, suppose they call for a, you know, an Islamic state uh, linked to Iran. The United States will never tolerate that. In fact, it's already said so. Uh, you can have a democracy as long as you do what we say. You have felt that uh, politics are driven by the economic interests of what you call the privileged elite. Can you tell me about that and who these people are? Now, first of all, that's not my opinion. That's the opinion of 100% of people who work on foreign affairs. I mean, it's an opinion with which you agree. Yeah, I mean, it's almost a truism. I mean, it's true of every country, not just the United States. I mean, there's an internal distribution of power in every country. You know, it's not that everybody is equal. And the internal distribution of power reflects itself in, uh, uh, in decision-making in the state system in different ways. I mean, if a country has a powerful uh, union movement, for example, there'll be a labor contribution to policy. The United States doesn't have that. Uh, we have basically business parties. And uh, there's, a, there's a concentrated uh, sector of economic power, kind of a corporate sector, uh, linked, to, uh, linked closely to government. And uh, they tend to set the basic framework for policy choices. I mean, it's not mechanical. You, know, you can't deduce that this or that policy is going to come out. But it's a very powerful framework f from which there's very little deviation. Actually, the media don't even tolerate any discussion of anything beyond it, except very much at the margins. Even if the population happens to, I mean, there, there are many striking cases where the population is pretty strongly opposed to policy. But if this, there's a split between elite opinion and popular opinion, uh, the, these issues just don't even show up in elections. I mean, international economic arrangements are a striking example. The population's almost but by substantial majority is opposed to most of the arrangements. There's near elite consensus. As a result, they just don't show up, except very marginally in uh, uh, political debate and political campaigns and other things. Actually, what I said about the Middle East is another example. Uh, roughly, I think, about two-thirds of the population uh, has, is, it supports the general international consensus that I mentioned. But uh, U.S. elite opinion does not. Uh, as a result, the issue just doesn't come up. The writer Tom Wolfe uh, calls this the old cabal theory and implies that it's kind of nutty, I guess. Uh, does that sort of criticism? Yeah, if you think it's nutty for uh, people with wealth and power to use their influence, um, it's, it's about as nutty as the fact that the sun rises every morning. A couple of your statements I will quote now. The Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor saved tens of millions of lives. How did yeah. that happen? It's not supportive of it. It's just saying you cannot evaluate an action by looking at the range of consequences. Actually, probably in, in India alone, it saved tens of millions of lives. How so? Kicking the British out. Uh, one of the results of the Jap wasn't the intention of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, but if you look at the events that unfolded, uh, one of the things that happened is that the Europeans mostly left Asia, not easily, you know. But, uh, so the French fought a brutal war, the Dutch fought a war, but they finally left. Uh, and the effect of that in Asia was dramatic. I mean, if you look at the demographic uh, patterns in, say, India, uh, there haven't been any major famines since the British left. Uh, there were terrible famines before. In fact, India you know, it barely developed during the British period, hundreds of years. It had been the commercial and one of the commercial and industrial centers of the world when the British took it over. Uh, the British turned it into an impoverished uh, agricultural society with a wealthy elite and some infrastructure, you know, based on their dominance. Uh, but uh, it was a miserable situation. I mean, people like Nehru, who was an Anglophile, uh, described the British as, you know, like uh, the Nazis. Uh, after independence, it's not a wonderful place by any means, but at least uh, the massive famine stopped. 
and some development picked up. Uh, and it's uh, much the same throughout Asia. Uh, so, so an indirect consequence of the Japanese aggression and violence happened to be the liberation of a good deal of Asia. Uh, that's incidentally why plenty of Asian nationalists supported the Japanese. For example, Sukarno in uh, Indonesia supported the Japanese all the way through. It was anti-fascist, but supported the Japanese because they were going to kick the Dutch out. Uh, and it's the same throughout. So, you know, actions have all kinds of consequences. But you cannot justify Japanese atrocities uh, and aggression on the basis of the fact that uh, inadvertent consequences happen to lead to the liberation of Asia. Asia, that was the context in which that comment was made. And it's, uh, I don't think there's any doubt of, of the historical accuracy of the comment. The U.S. bombing in Afghanistan was silent genocide. No, what I said is that if they, that the assumptions they were making were that that could well be a consequence. Remember, the bombing of Afghanistan was taken on the assumption that it might well lead, put millions of people at risk of starvation. That assumption was very widespread. You can read it in uh, uh, Harvard's uh, major international journal, International Security. Uh, the New York Times, for example, estimated after a month that the number of people at risk of starvation had risen by 50 percent from 5 million to 7.5 million. And in fact, uh, right after September 11th, even before the bombing, uh, the U.S. Uh, ordered Pakistan to terminate uh, food supplies that were keeping a good part of the population at the edge of survival. So that policy, under the assumptions in which the policy was being conducted, could well have led to silent genocide. Now, that's one of the reasons why rational people should oppose policies like that. You said that if the Nuremberg principles were applied, every post-World War II president would be uh, indictable. It's mm, probably true. Can we run, uh, run down them real fast? What did Eisenhower do that you would indict him for? Well, Eisenhower uh, overthrew the conservative nationalist government of Iran with a military coup. Uh, he overthrew the first and last democratic government in Guatemala by a military coup and invasion, leading to years of it. Uh, in Iran, it led to 25 years of brutal dictatorship, uh, finally overthrown in 79. In Guatemala, it led to massive atrocities, which are still continuing. That's after almost 50 years. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, this wasn't known until recently, but he conducted the uh, major clandestine terror operation of the post-war period up until Cuba and Nicaragua in an effort to break up uh, Indonesia, strip off the outer islands uh, where most of the resources are, uh, and uh, undermine the what was then considered as a threat of Indonesian democracy. Uh, Indonesia was too free and open. It was allowing a... Uh, political party of the poor to participate, and they were gaining a lot of ground, so that uh, uh, Eisenhower supported and helped instigate a, a military rebellion in the Outer Islands. Uh, this is just for starters. Uh, these are all indictable offenses. What about Kennedy? Kennedy was one of the worst. Uh, Kennedy, first of all, invaded South Vietnam. Uh, during the Eisenhower administration, uh, they had blocked a political settlement in 1954 and instituted a kind of a Latin American style terror state, which had killed maybe 60 or 70,000 people by the end of the Eisenhower uh, period and had instigated uh, uh, a response, a reaction. Uh, Kennedy recognized that it couldn't be controlled internally, so he simply invaded. Uh, in 1962, uh, about uh, a third of the bombing missions that were carried out by the U.S. Air Force in uh, uh, South U.S. planes with South Vietnamese insignia, but U.S. pilot. Uh, they author he authorized napalm. Uh, he began the uh, use of uh, chemical weapons to uh, destroy food crops. Uh, uh, they began programs which uh, drove millions of people into what amounted to concentration camps. Now, that's aggression. 
uh, in the case of Cuba, it was just a massive campaign of international terrorism, which almost led to the destruction of the world, led to the missile crisis. Uh, and uh, we can continue. Again, these are all uh, indictable offenses. What about Johnson? Well, Johnson expanded the war in Indochina to the point where ended up you know, probably leaving three or four million people dead. Uh, he uh, invaded the Dominican Republic to block uh, what looked like a potential democratic revolution there, uh, supported uh, the Israeli uh, occupation in its early stages. Uh, again, we can go around the world. Uh, pick your take, um, take, say, Carter. You know, I'll, I'll get there, but Nixon's okay. next. Uh, Nixon, we don't even have to talk about. <laughs> we, can, we can skip that one, okay? <laughs> but uh, yeah, Ford, then Ford. Well, Ford was only there for a short of time, but long enough to uh, endorse the Indonesian invasion of East Timor, uh, which became about as close to genocide as anything in the modern period. Uh, they pretended to uh, oppose it, but secretly supported, in fact, not so secretly. Uh, the, uh, the U.S., uh, dip, uh, for, uh, immediately after the invasion, the U.S. did join the rest of the world in formally condemning it at the Security Council. But uh, Ambassador Moynihan uh, was kind enough to explain to us, in his words, uh, that uh, his instructions were to render the United Nations utterly ineffective in any actions it might take to counter the Indonesian in great, uh, invasion. And he says proudly that he did this with considerable success. Uh, his next sentence says, uh, in the next few months, it seems that about 60,000 people were killed. And then he goes off to the next topic. Uh, that's the first few months went on to probably hundreds of thousands. Uh, uh, formally, the U.S. Uh, announced a boycott of weapons, but secretly it increased the supply of weapons, including counterinsurgency equipment, so that the Indonesians could consummate the invasion. Uh, that's uh, just a short period in office, but that's indictable. Seriously, in fact, that's a major war crime. Carter? Carter uh, increased, as the Indonesian atrocities were increasing, they peaked in 1978. Uh, Carter's flow of weapons to Indonesia increased. Uh, when Congress imposed a human rights restrictions, by then there was a human rights movement in Congress uh, to block the flow of uh, uh, advanced weaponry to Indonesia, uh, Carter uh, arranged through Mondale, vice president, uh, to get Israel to send U.S. Skyhawks to Indonesia uh, to enable Indonesia to complete what turned out to be near genocide, killing maybe a quarter of the population or something. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East, uh, Carter just won the Nobel Prize. Uh, his great achievement was the Camp David Agreements. Uh, the Camp David Agreements are presented as a uh, diplomatic triumph for the United States. In fact, they were a diplomatic catastrophe. Uh, at Camp David, uh, the United States and Israel accepted, finally, Egypt's 1971 offer, which they had then, the U.S. had rejected at the time, uh, except that now it was worse from the U.S.-Israeli point of view because it included the Palestinians. Uh, in order to accept, get Israel to accept Egypt's 1971 offer after a major war and atrocities and so on, uh, Carter raised uh, aid, military and other aid to Israel to more than 50% of total aid worldwide. Israel used it at once in exactly the way they said they were going to do, and as every sane person knew, uh, as an opportunity to attack their northern neighbor, first in 1978, then in 1982, and to increase uh, integration of the occupied territories. Uh, and that's for starters. We can continue. Reagan? I don't think we have to talk about that one either. I mean, Reagan is the first president to have been uh, uh, condemned by the International Court of Justice for what they called the unlawful use of force, meaning international terrorism, in the war against Nicaragua. Again, that's just for starters. Uh, they also, the Security Council, uh, endorsed it in two resolutions, both of which were vetoed by the United States. Bush won. 
Well, uh, for, we can begin with the invasion of Panama. Uh, the invasion of Panama, which according to the Panamanians, killed about 3,000 people since it's never investigated. We don't know if that's true or not. Uh, this was done in order to uh, kidnap a uh, disobedient thug who had been supported by the United States right through his worst atrocities. Noriega. Noriega. He was brought to Florida and tried for crimes that he committed mostly on the CIA payroll. Okay, that's aggression. Uh, we could go into the details of the war in Iraq, uh, but uh, uh, there were plainly opportunities for, they might not have worked, we don't know, but there were opportunities for diplomatic settlement, which the Bush administration refused to consider, and incidentally the pr press would not report, with a single exception, and Long Island Newsday, which did report the whole story throughout accurately, and is the only newspaper in the country to have done so. Uh, the uh, uh, Bush administration then did attack, and uh, the attack was uh, carried out in, uh, in a manner which is criminal under the laws of war. Um, they attacked uh, uh, infrastructure. I mean, if you attack New York City, and you destroy the electrical system, the power system, the sewage systems, and so on, that amounts to biological warfare, and that's the nature of the attack. Uh, then came a sanctions regime, which uh, it's mostly Clinton, but began with Bush, which is, by conservative estimates, killed hundreds of thousands of people while strengthening Saddam Hussein. That takes us off to Clinton, which that's the beginning, but that's by no means the end. Run through it. Well, we can run through it. that one case suffices. All right. But there are plenty of others. Bush I mean, too. Well, let's take. Let's go on with Clinton. Okay. I mean, one of Clinton's <laughs> minor esca minor escapades, very minor, was sending a couple of cruise missiles uh, to the Sudan to destroy what they knew to be a pharmaceutical plant. There was no intelligence failure, according to the only estimates we have from the German ambassador and the. Uh, uh, director, a regional director of Near East Foundation, who does field work in uh, Sudan. Both of them estimate several tens of thousands of deaths from one cruise missile attack. It's pretty serious. If somebody uh, did that to us, we'd regard it as bad news. And again, we can continue. Uh, during in the Middle East, for example, the uh, 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 Clinton began by declaring past UN resolutions, uh, in the words of his administration, uh, obsolete and anachronistic. Okay, so we're finished with that. No more international law. Uh, then comes a, poly uh, a period called a peace process, except that during the peace process, uh, Israeli, uh, US, uh, Israeli settlement, which means settlement paid for by the U.S. taxpayer and supported by U.S. military aid and diplomacy, continually increased. Uh, the, the most extreme year was Clinton's last year, the highest level of settlement, the highest since 1992. Uh, meanwhile, the territories were cantonized, broken up into small regions with uh, infrastructure projects and new settlement. Uh, I don't know what you call that, but it's under military occupation. And if anyone else was doing it, we'd call it a war crime. And again, we can continue. Bush too, I don't think we have to discuss. Your call. Okay. <laughs> How does, um, well, I want to get back to one thing you said. Uh, Newsday apparently got off the reservation uh, somehow. What happened there? I have no idea. But uh, one, particularly one reporter, Newt Royce, kept reporting everything that was happening. I have a guess. I mean, what was going on was that he was reporting leaks from the government. The, gov the U.S. The State Department was leaking reports from August, August 90, right up to through December, the planning for the war, leaking reports saying that Iraq was making offers that the State Department regarded as serious and negotiable, maybe not acceptable, but negotiable. Now, you know, no one in the State Department leaks reports to a suburban newspaper. What I assume was happening was that they were leaking them to the New York Times, which was refusing to print them. And then they leaked them to Newsday, which appears on every newsstand in New York City with a big full front page headline saying, you know, Iraq offers this and that. I mean, 
Can you think of any other explanation? If you were in the State Department, would you leak documents to Newsday? But, uh, but it's, a, it's a part of an immense corporation, Newsday, yeah. the Times Mirror New Corporation. Newsday, right? And somehow that newspaper alone, and this one reporter, in fact, who I don't know, but he was doing a very good job, uh, kept reporting it. But, uh, and, and what typically happened is that uh, Newsday would report it, big front page story, and a couple of days later in the Times and the sort of back pages, you'd see a phrase saying, well, reports claim that uh, the Iraq made an offer, but the White House denies it or something. So very few people in the country knew about this. We've got a few minutes left before we're going to uh, open this for questions from the, from the people here in the studio. You've said either the general population will take control of our destiny or there will be no destiny for anyone to control. Why is that so? I think we, the, we are in a situation where I mean, the human species has developed the capacity to destroy itself and everything else. Now, that's been true since the Second World War. Uh, and we are edging very close to the possibility of that happening. It's come very close in the past. I mean, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which uh, uh, Arthur Schlesinger described as the most dangerous moment in human history, uh, we just learned last October how dangerous it was. Uh, last October, it was revealed that the at retrospective conference of participants in Havana, uh, American, Russian, and Cuban, uh, that uh, the world was literally one word away from terminal nuclear war. Uh, Russian submarine commanders, it uh, turns out, had uh, nuclear-tipped missiles. And uh, they were under attack by American destroyers at the edge of Kennedy's quarantine zone. They assumed the nuclear war was going on. Two of the commanders ordered the missiles sent. That would have led to a devastating response, uh, taking out Moscow, then comes New York, and then we're over. Uh, one commander countermanded. Uh, that was a consequence of an international terrorist war aimed at regime change. Those notions are right in the headlines. And that's, we're coming very close to that now. I mean, the preventive war doctrine uh, last September is just uh, instructing people in the world that you'd better develop weapons of mass destruction or a means of terrorism in order to deter the United States. Mm -hmm. Where's that going to lead? Mm -hmm. Or take uh, in another domain, uh, uh, nobody really understands in any detail what's going on with the climate. You know, it's a complicated issue. But there's a near consensus among scientists that we're playing with fire. You know, could be. It's kind of like Afghanistan. You, you're risking the possibility of very severe destruction if anything goes wrong. These are sort of nonlinear processes. I mean, a slight change could have a big effect. And you don't know what's going to happen. You know, maybe an ice age in Europe or, or some other thing. Well, you know, we're very near the edge in nuclear weapons uh, development, in uh, other weapons of mass destruction, in policies that are creating international chaos, in uh, destroying, possibly destroying an environment in which uh, decent survival is possible. Nobody, you can't, none of this is predictable. It's just all too close for comfort. And it, things are tending in that direction. I mean, and it's been, it's, it's not particularly new. I mean, take, say, the history of Europe. You know, for hundreds of years, Europe was the most savage place in the world. Uh, the main activity of Europeans was slaughtering each other. And meanwhile, on the side, conquering most of the world. Uh, in 1945, they called it off. Why? Well, very straightforward reason. Uh, it was understood by French and Germans and British that the next time they play the centuries-old game of slaughtering each other, it's going to be the end of the world because they had developed means of destruction so enormous that you just can't do it anymore. So now Europe is a peaceful region. Uh, but unless that extends to the world, the uh, same problems are going to arise. What's the good news? <laughs>
the good news is uh, that um, there's lots of good news. Uh, part of it is that as a result of the activism of the last 40 years, which has been extensive, the United States is a much more civilized country than it was in the past. And the same has happened all over good parts of the world. Uh, there's now extensive, I mean, there are all kinds of things that we didn't even exist before, women's rights, uh, minority rights, um, an environmental movement, uh, anti-nuclear movements, international solidarity movements, uh, global justice movements. N none of this existed 40, 45 years ago. Uh, most of it is post-1960s. That started it off, but then it took off. It's changed, uh, hasn't changed institutions, but it has changed consciousness and awareness. Uh, and it's true of a large part of the world. Actually, much of the initiative for these developments is coming from the South. And there's a good reason why the World Social Forum meets in Brazil, not in Paris or New York. It's because that's where the leading edge of the uh, activism is for significant social change throughout much of the South. The North has joined to an extent, and these are hopeful possibilities for popular movements reversing a course that's a very dangerous one. On that note of optimism, we'll take questions now from people here in the audience. I noticed that you mentioned that when U.S. government tries to pick up a target to attack, they usually pick up a weak, defenseless, and important target. So since uh, the I Iraqi issue has uh, now has been uh, announced to be officially uh, end, and also uh, it, uh, it is also said that there are several possible targets that U.S. government might pick up. So uh, one example might be in the, the North Korea, but uh, it is recently, it, it, recently it has been said that the U.S. Army station in North Korea have uh, retreated uh, to, to, to Japan. So, South Korea. Excuse me? It's stationed in South Korea. Uh, oh, so, sorry, in yeah. South Korea, sorry, has, uh, has retreated to Japan. But it seems that North, it seems that the war will uh, break out, I mean, according to some people's belief, but it seems that uh, North Korea is a country with uh, almost no resources, but it's also uh, quite uh, defensive, and uh, it, has, it is said that it has, has nuclear weapons. So I wonder whether you have any opinion uh, on this issue and what kind of benefits will be brought to America if you know, the war breaks. Well, um, first of all, the, the, this is about attacking defenseless enemies. I actually happen to be paraphrasing a uh, leaked intelligence document from the Bush one administration. Uh, when they came into office, like every administration, they uh, call for an intelligence survey of the world. Usually we don't find out about it for 30 or 40 years until it gets declassified. But in this case, someone leaked a paragraph from, from it, and it was published by uh, Maureen Dowd in the New York Times. Her column is considered a kind of gossip column, so people don't read it very carefully. But she actually did publish in 1990 or so uh, the paragraph that was leaked from that document. And what it said is that uh, in the case of confrontation with much weaker enemies, which it's tacitly assumed are the only ones you're going to attack, in the case of confrontations with much weaker enemies, uh, the United States must defeat them decisively and rapidly uh, because otherwise political support will erode. It's not the 1960s when Kennedy could carry out a war for years and Johnson could escalate it with no protest. Now you've got to build up the enemy to look like a massive force and then destroy him decisively and rapidly, and you've got to pick a much weaker one. And that's a sensible, you, know, you may not like it, but it's a rational doctrine. And if you look at the wars of the 90s, that's what they are. Uh, the North Korea case is a complicated one. Uh, the uh, uh, what the United States has been telling the world loud and clear for the last couple of months is that if you want to prevent us from attacking you, you'd better have a deterrent. I mean, Iraq had no deterrent, so therefore you can smash it. And North Korea had a deterrent, not nuclear weapons, incidentally. Uh, massed artillery. They have massed artillery aimed at Seoul and at the American forces there. And unless the Pentagon can figure out a way to take them out with precision-guided munitions before they're used, 
it could just be devastating. Actually, the predictions in the Clinton years from the Pentagon were that if the U.S. was to go to war, they, as one general put it, they better have 100,000 body bags ready. Uh, so North Korea has deterrent, which is conventional, of nuclear weapons. They may have a couple of years from now, but that's not the issue now. Uh, and that held off an attack. Well, why is North Korea important? You're completely right. It has no resources. It's one of the poorest, most, uh, most horrifying countries in the world. But it's right in the middle of a crucial area. Uh, this whole region uh, is a rapidly developing economic region. Uh, it has tremendous resources in Siberia, you know, lots of gas and oil and other resources, has huge uh, countries that are industrialized and need the resources, uh, particularly Japan and uh, South Korea, but now China too, which is now a resource importer. And there's a good reason to expect that that whole region is going to go off in its own independent direction. Uh, the United States does not want that. It's, it's, it wants that region to be subordinated to U.S. power. And North Korea happens to be right in the middle of it. Uh, if there's going to be pipelines from you know, Siberia to uh, South Korea and off to Japan, that's where they're going to go. Uh, so it itself has no you know, material significance, but its position in one of the most rapidly developing regions of the world definitely does. I appreciate your emphasis is, is on hope as... Uh or as activism as being a source of hope. And as an as a academic in training and a political organizer, um, in the last two years I've, I've experienced an inertia in the academic class, so to speak, that I've never experienced before and I've been organizing for a number of years, including the first Gulf War. And so the first part of the question is, why do you think it is that at absolutely the most critical time, the most you know, the mask has been removed in a lot of sense of this of this push, an expansion of empire, so to speak. That that's the time that the such extreme inertia has set in, and that people feel so impotent. And then um, the second part of the question is, how do you recommend breaking through that, um, particularly in the academic class, because they have such resources. Um, and I'm wondering if something like the French-based attack organization may be somewhat of a model. And I just want to get your opinion on that. Well, if, first of all, your age is significant. Uh, the academic world has never been a source of, uh, rarely been a source of activism. It usually comes from somewhere else. I mean, there was a brief period in which it was true in the late 60s, uh, late 60s, uh, not in the earlier period, when parts of the academic world, mostly students, incidentally, very few faculty, uh, did become actively engaged in elite universities and elsewhere. Uh, then it kind of died down. In the 1980s, it uh, happened to be an extremely activist period, but it was not coming from the academic world. It was coming more from churches in the Midwest and places like that. The Central America Solidarity Movement was extremely significant. didn't get a lot of attention because it was not coming from elite centers. Uh, but this is the first time in the history of imperialism, hundreds of years, that people from the imperial country actually went to live with the victims to try to help them and protect them. I mean, you know, nobody in France went to live in Algeria during the Algerian War to live in an Algerian village, you know, or ever. The Vietnam War was never even thought about, and the whole history of European and U.S. imperialism never happened. But that happened on a very substantial scale in the 1980s. That's the reason why you now have volunteers in many parts of the world, including the Israeli-occupied territories. It's all an outgrowth of this. But the academic world was almost completely not involved. The uh, same is true in the 1990s. It hasn't been the academic world. Now, like the global justice movements, which are the biggest ones, uh, they didn't come out. I mean, there's students involved, you know, a couple of faculty here and there. But it's mostly coming from elsewhere. Yeah, I didn't mean to imply that, actually. I didn't mean yeah. to imply that the academic world. No, I mean, we haven't been in the, the academic way, world. So, rightly, we should be concerned about what goes on there. You know, you and I aren't going to organize steel workers, but uh, we can do things where we live. So, that's just the right question. Uh, what can change it is what's always done it in the past. You know, people working hard to uh, educate, to organize, to raise issues. Uh, I mean, we have tremendous privileges. You know, in most parts of the world, if people try to do things like this, they, uh, 
uh, face uh, torture or assassination or something or other. Uh, we don't face anything, you know, we're completely free. We have a legacy of freedom that's uh, unparalleled. We have enormous resources and privilege. We've got every opportunity we can think of. Uh, what's lacking is will. Uh, so one of the things that's common in a kind of a youth culture, student culture, like the academic world, is a very short attention span. You know, you figure things have to be done soon. And if they don't work in a week, you know, we quit. Like I went to a demonstration and nothing happened. Okay, now I'm gonna quit. Uh, if you want anything to change, it's gotta, it means work over a long time, lots of defeats, uh, occasional victories, uh, you know, ultimately you get somewhere. You think of any popular movement that's ever done anything, you know, abolitionism, uh, you know, women's rights, uh, anything you think of, that's the way it works. Now, that was what was different in the working class culture that I grew up in as a kid. Now, these came from movements that thought you're going to have to work hard for a long time to try to achieve something. And that's, yes, that's what happens. It's not going to be any quick victories. Uh, but there are plenty of opportunities and you just have to keep that. Attack, uh, yeah. Well, attack is an interesting group and it's done important things. It's fairly elite outfit. Uh, but it's one of the groups that was instrumental in setting up the World Social Forum. And they're pretty narrowly focused on a few crucial issues. Uh, like uh, one of their big issues is a Tobin tax, you know, tax on financial uh, interactions, which is probably a good idea. There's other possibilities like it. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been a very influential and important group, and it's uh, starting in the United States, incidentally. So there are subgroups here. It's international, based in France. Uh, and it's the kind of thing that could be part of a serious uh, U.S. Uh, organizing effort, but only part, I think. Yes, sir. Um, given uh, human rights violations by corporations, I was wondering how you make your purchasing decisions and if there are any products that you don't purchase. Well, plenty of things I don't purchase, but not really for that reason. I mean, these are questions of tactics. I mean, do you affect human rights? Oh, let's take Coca-Cola, which is a big thing around here, I understand. Uh, Coca-Cola uh, has just been it's narrowly scraped by a uh, district court case in Florida that was brought by the steel workers uh, in support of Colombian workers in a subsidiary of a Coca-Cola plant, which is one of the most vicious anti-union plants almost anywhere. And the particular case was a union activist who was murdered by paramilitaries in the plant. And the steel workers who are pressing these human rights cases for Colombians, they can't do it themselves, are using provisions of American law, which do exist and have sometimes been applied. And they brought a case in Florida, uh, which got to the district court. Uh, and uh, they sort of have a half victory. The district court severed Coca-Cola from the case, but kept the subsidiary. Uh, well, you know, severing Coca-Cola was a technicality. So does that mean you should stop buying Coca-Cola? Well, if you stop buying Coca-Cola, is that going to help union activists in Colombia? Uh, that's the question you have to ask. These are, and you know, I don't think there's a simple answer. Like if you stop buying Coca-Cola, it's not going to have any effect. If there was a massive boycott of it, uh, they'd notice it in the corporate headquarters uh, and, uh, and might do something. Like for example, Nike uh, and Re uh, what's the other one? Reebok or something, the guys who make sneakers, uh, and things like that, have uh, modified somewhat their horrendous human rights practices in uh, plants in Asia as a result of pressure, m most of it coming from students. And that, yeah, that had an effect. But uh, these are questions you just have to answer in terms of their likely consequences for people who are suffering. There's no point in making gestures. Professor Noam Chomsky, thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm.